Conversations. I'm Marty Owings, joined by our producer, Craig Stallmacher. This is our first ever broadcast and the first ever live interactive broadcast from the Capitol. Uh, it's interactive because we invite you as participants, viewers, to join us on the program. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, thank you for tuning in tonight. Tonight on the program, we'll be joined by DFL Representative John Lesh and Republican Mike Beard, and a freshman legislator will uh, tell us what it's like to be a brand new lawmaker on the first day of session. Tonight, we also invite you, our viewers, to participate. As I mentioned, you can send us your questions and comments via Twitter at MNCAPNews. That's MNCAPNews. You can find us there. And we'll share uh, your comments and questions on the air tonight. Um, and so that's how that will work. Are you panning out, Craig, so that we can uh, in invite our guests into the conversation here? I want to introduce our guests here. Uh, without any further delay, uh, welcome to both of you. John Lesh is a DFL lawmaker from St. Paul in his fifth term, and Mike Beard is a representative from District 35A, Shakopee area. Right? Shakopee Prior Lake, yes. Shakopee Prior Lake, also in his fifth term. Welcome to both of you. Thanks, Thanks for, for having us. Good to be here. Appreciate it. Well, uh, let's just get started. Let's start with the budget. Uh, it's ginormous. That was a <laughs> word that was used. Uh, but hey, there isn't agreement on uh, what exactly the deficit is. Good evening. I'm Marty Owings. Welcome to Capital Conversations, where we broadcast every week live from the Capitol. That's why we call it Capital Conversations. Thanks for joining us tonight. Tonight on the program, we'll be joined by Tom Emery. He's a former lawmaker from Delano, Minnesota, and a, most recently a Republican candidate for governor. Mr. Emmer lost the election by the narrowest of margins, and we'll revisit the election a little bit tonight uh, with uh, Mr. Emmer. Welcome to the program. Well, thank you for having me, Mark. Glad you could be here. Uh, also joining us will be David Fitzsimmons, who was Tom uh, Emmer's campaign manager for much of the campaign. And later on, uh, checking in with us will be Professor Doug, Doug Rosno and political analyst Mitch Berg to give us their take on all the political happenings so far this session. Did I, I said political right? I don't care. <laughs> Whatever. As always, we welcome your comments and questions. Just post your thoughts to us at our Twitter account at MNCAPNews, or you can visit us on Facebook at Minnesota Capital News. Leave us a message. We'll ask it live on the air if it's not offensive or humorless, <laughs> any of those things. Well, former State Representative Tom Emmer, three terms in the legislature, a run for the big office. Um, how's it going? It's going well. It's going well. It is a wonderful winter. Lots of snow. Finally have a real Minnesota winter, and I have the uh, rink up and running in the backyard. The kids have been on it for the last few weeks. Uh, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, Minnesota moves forward. Let's talk about the, the polling and how, what, first of all, let's start there. The NPR Humphrey poll comes out. It shows a 12-point lead for Dave. Yes. Uh, and, and then on the heels of that, the KSCP poll comes out, and, and it's much different. Yes. And it raised a red flag. Right. And then we come to find out that 612 was oversampled. There's all kinds of things that go. Talk about that a little bit. Right. And then that, I mean, that was the second time they had done it. And we, you know, we, we spoke about how the polling in the, in the uh, Dayton uh, Kelleher race proved to be almost 11 points incorrect, uh, scarcely a, a week after they had taken the poll. And so I think there were already, there should have been a lot more attention paid to how accurate are these polls and are they really giving people, uh, you know, the picture that they have. And the, the polls, you know, I think there, there's some measure that they impact uh, uh, the general electorate. You know, people get uh, turnout, they decide to turn out or not turn out. They're also a, a huge impact in the, in the donor community because at these largely are guys that just want to look at a, uh, uh, you know, P and L statement. I mean, they they they're analysts uh, to the nth degree, and so they want to just look at numbers, tell me the facts, and uh, I'm going to make a decision and move on. And and when you walk in and you say, uh, you know, we need help, and uh, we're 12 points down, uh, they say, well, yeah, you need a lot of help. And, uh, so when when looking at the fact that that there really wasn't that twelve point gap that that was all a, uh, a really a mirage and and, and made up that uh, and everything bore that out you know other polling uh, internal polling and then uh, you know definitively the election itself uh, all those polls that had it far outside proved to be absolutely incorrect and uh, I, I think it it did play a part. And, uh, you know, 
all these things are how much of a part did it play. You, ne you never can tell. I mean, it's something. And what adds up to 8,800, I don't know. So, so you knew this. You knew this, that when it was happening, your campaign was grinding on this. I know the day it came out, you guys were talking about this. Probably, what did you, did you have a little team huddle and say, what, what the hell do we do about this? What's going on? What happened? Well, no, I think David would confirm for you that uh, if there was one thing I was good at, it was separating myself from that, uh, it, it, that office chatter. You know, they would call me the day before a poll came out. I'd get a phone call. I'd be somewhere around Minnesota, and they'd say, hey, just want to let you know we expect this poll to come out tomorrow, and don't be surprised if this is what it shows. You know, and don't, it, well, I got used to that. It's funny to me uh, that they would be calling me and telling me, historically, the Star Tribune poll, you can always, uh, it'll be five, as many as five points off from reality. And they knew that already. And yet, uh, well, and some would say more. Uh, but this is historic. Right. Uh, it's not just this year. This has been going on for a long time. It's just that I think this year, there was such a stark contrast in candidates. Mm -hmm. You know, Mark uh, Dayton, uh, which I, I do appreciate, he never waffled on his position as to what he believed in, which is bigger government and tax the rich, that whole thing. And I was just the opposite. We were talking about smaller government, and we were talking about economic freedom and individual liberty. And uh, it was funny. There were just two completely opposite positions. And these polls were coming out almost, what, more pronounced than they had been in the past. I had a lot of fun with them, though, Marty. You know, yeah. I get that call the day before. Poll had come out the next day. Somebody would ask me on a radio station, "Oh, what about this poll that says whatever?" I started doing stump speeches based on the polling. Before you know, they came. I would tell them, you know, I'd get to Moorhead and I'd say, you know, amazing thing happened. We've got the momentum. I got. Uh, I was in southern Minnesota this morning, and I was 12 points down according to the NPR poll. And by the time I got to Moorhead, we've been campaigning so hard all day. We're now in a dead heat. <laughs> I mean, we've moved that much in just six hours or eight hours. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and people on the outside probably, you know, maybe didn't quite understand that the same as people on the but yeah, I get it. I mean, that, I that worked, but that was yeah. playing to the audiences that yeah. we saw on the street in the cafe. Right, and sure. David's talking about a completely different uh, group, and this is right. what I don't think somebody like me running for statewide office understood. We built a, a grassroots organization from the ground up to get the endorsement, and we went to build that even bigger once we got through the endorsement. Yeah. David started talking about there's another layer above it. These are not people that might show up at your precinct caucuses or your conventions. These are people that are growing opportunities in this state or running major organizations. They won't tell you that they're a Republican or a Democrat. They're just interested in the future for the opportunities that they're growing and their own lifestyle. Well, those people, a lot of the time, aren't doing this one-on-one. -on -one. They're getting their information through these media outlets, and when they see a poll that shows some dramatic change, right. they tend to get a little cold and they draw back and mm -hmm. it sure. makes it, you got to work twice as hard. A question from our producer. I do have a question off the internet today. Okay. Someone asked, um, Tom Emmer, do you agree with the Republican Party censuring all those Republicans, the prominent ones, um, after they oh, were... The Horner supporters. Right. No, I don't. Yeah, I, I, and, and I would say it differently. I think uh, the people that voted on that had every right to do what they did just as much as I, those folks should be able to say that I have the right to have my opinion. We don't want to be the party of exclusion. We want to be the party of inclusion. Uh, yes, I, I know the argument is, well, you know, they're openly supporting uh, Democrats, whatever. That's great. But you know what? I'm going to conventions right now where I'm being introduced to people who say, I became a Republican this year. It, it shouldn't be about, uh, you know, punishment. It should be about this is what we have to offer, and this is why you folks have to be with us. And I, I think from that standpoint, you know, plus Governor Quee and some others, these are, uh, I think there's a better way to do that, and it's through communication, not excommunication. <laughs>
so people know me from my radio voice uh, doing uh, political and economic and finance commentary. I'm currently on Business 1570. I still do yeah. a show, a once a week show on business and financial issues there. That's right, because in addition to being a legislator and a radio host, you're also a professor of economics. That's right. That's professor right. of economics, St. Cloud State, have been there for 26 years. Yeah. Congratulations and uh, obviously welcome to the legislature. Well, thank you very much, Marty. This is a, just a gorgeous place. Uh, I, I actually had not walked into this room until today. I had not walked onto the floor. I had not, I just kind of had left it so that I could enjoy and respect, you know, the, the, the awesomeness of this place. I mean, yeah. and I, I know awesome is now a word that kids use so much, it's <laughs> kind of lost meaning, but, but in its real meaning that, that, I mean, I literally spent the first five minutes in here probably with my mouth more open than closed, <laughs> just like, wow, will you look at that, yeah. you know, the picture of Lincoln mm -hmm. over the speaker's uh, seat, uh, the, the, just the dais up front, I walked back into the retiring room uh, with my son, uh, and uh, we walked around and the painting on the wall there that's done there is just fantastic. It, yeah. it is really, a, it's really a special place. I'm kind of sad it took this to get me down to see it. I wish <laughs> I had seen it before. And I hope everybody, every citizen of Minnesota gets to see this is their house. Yeah. And it really is. And to see this place um, gives you a feeling that, you know, you are in fact part of history. Yeah. And as I took the oath, that's exactly what I felt, a part of history. Fantastic. All right, okay, let's welcome our first two guests tonight. First of all, Senator Warren Lemmer is a Republican lawmaker from Maple Grove in his sixth term. He currently serves as the chair of the Senate Judiciary, and, uh, and uh, we're also joined by Senator John Marty, who's a Democrat from Roseville, represents District 54 in his eighth term, and uh, welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Your thoughts about first what happened and then the security? Well, the events of Saturday were disgusting, I guess is the best word that I can come up with. It, it saddens me that uh, whether or not this is an isolated case or if it's something that is going to expand in some type of copycat type scenario, it's sad that uh, a public official who sacrifices time with family, who sacrifices time uh, in their own business pursuits, is literally gunned down on the streets, doing the very job that she should be doing, and that's interacting with the people she represents. Exactly. This has happened before. There was a, somebody fired shots at the governor's mansion during the Quee administration, I remember, and a lot of concern uh, at that time. But I, I think we shouldn't just brush it off saying that, you know, um, we've got to make some decisions here, and it's going to be a, one, it's costly to do security, but it's important to do, but two, you have to balance between the public access and the security, and, and I think we're all very concerned both for the security of people, but also that we don't destroy the ability of people, politicians, and their constituents to meet with each other and discuss the issues. And that's why this is called the People's House. I mean, this is a building. We want the public to be here and it's going to be some tough decisions, and I wish Senator Limmer and the others on that task force uh, the best because it's going to be a tough job to do. All right, welcome back. I'm Marty Owings, and now we're joined by Tom Horner, former Independence Party gubernatorial candidate uh, for governor and frequent contributor to uh, editorials throughout Minnesota. <laughs> Every so often they give me access to their pages. Welcome to the program, Mr. Thank Horner. you very much. Good nice to, to see be you. here. Well, Let's talk for a minute about tax reform because you wrote about that in your editorial. Right. Now, uh, you say that a rewards-based system would encourage investment and be a more progressive form of taxation. How so? Well, I do agree with with Senator Dayton, uh, Governor Dayton, to, to to this extent that yeah, now um, Governor, now you're Governor Dayton, I know, oh, right, yeah. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. It, it's he past you, November second. I and, 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 and Marty, I'm not sure you, and the listeners and viewers, I'm over it. Okay. You know, I look at. I feel I ran the campaign I wanted to run. I was the candidate I wanted to be. It was a great opportunity, great experience. You got to let it go sometimes. Absolutely, oh, I let it. I let it go at midnight on November second. Sure. So. Um, right. and, and I mean that sincerely. Right, um, so but, but, but I do agree to this extent with, with Governor Dayton that, that I think the, the system of government in Minnesota ought to be progressive. Where I disagree with Governor Dayton is that he looks at only a narrow slice, just the income tax and just the top rate. 
And I think that's only a small piece of it. I mean, we ought to look at what are called tax expenditures, the deductions that, that go disproportionately to higher income people. We ought to look at the spending side, where Minnesota does do a lot for not just low income people, but middle income people. When you look at all of, of government's role in our lives, taxation as well as spending, we ought to then make sure that the whole bailiwick is, is progressive. I think more importantly, though, what we get stuck in right now, and you heard a little bit of it between Senator Marty and Senator Limmer, is um, just this, this debate between cuts only or taxes only. We, Paul Gardner is a former state representative from Shoreview who served in the legislature from 2007 to 2010. That was two terms. Defeated Phil Crinky actually, to get your seat. Um, you served on a number of finance committees, including the tax committee, in your most recent term, if I have that correct. Now, uh, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, I'm glad you could come. Now, here's the thing. You, you and I had a conversation about this. You basically pulled back the veil on the budget process, and not everybody likes that. Not everybody likes the idea, but on your blog, you posted uh, the manual for the budget process, basically what it takes from cradle to grave to get a budget done. It's well, it's not a WikiLeaks deal or anything. But well, it sure <laughs> seemed like it. Well, Secretary Ritchie, uh, welcome to the program. Uh, and good to have you. Thank you very much for having me on. Recounts. Uh, you're just going to keep going, doing them every as exciting. You know, it seems like they come up all the time. Well, in Minnesota, we always have a lot of recounts, and they're often at the most local level. And in fact, uh, when you have an exact tie in Minnesota, we flip a coin, and we had two coin flips in the last election. But Why usually, we the, do that in the other two elections. Save if, a lot of money. If in time. fact the election had ended in an exact tie, we would determine the winner by flipping a coin. But in, in the case of a statewide recount, what you're accurate about is that it is typically not very often. I think 1934, then 1962, and that was the most famous one, right. the Robog Anderson. But in fact, we've had three in these last two cycles over two years. Yeah. A Supreme Court race, which was in the primary, smaller, but still statewide. And then the two, the U.S. Senate and the governor's race. I think we have over the years by testing our equipment and we do small recounts of every county after every election to double check the machines what we've determined is that we can safely set the trigger for taxpayer paid recounts because that's what we're really talking about there's always recounts and candidates can always have a recount but when do the taxpayers pay for them right now we trigger them at a half of a percent difference we can be safe and trigger them at a lower, therefore saving taxpayers some money potentially right. in future elections. So yeah, I'm guessing, yeah, yeah, the legislature yeah. will be considering uh, in this session lowering the trigger for the taxpayer payments. But I think Minnesotans are going to stay active. We're still going to be the top voting state in the nation. We're going to still be spirited. We've always had recounts. We'll keep having them. It's my pleasure now to be joined by uh, State Representative Jeff Hayden. Good. He's a DFLer from Minneapolis. Absolutely. How are you, Marty? Uh, Good to see you. In your second term. Here. Second term. Said, you can't be. A, you're not a rookie anymore. No, not you a rookie anymore. No. no more hazing. No, no more hazing. I'm a vet. Right. I got hazing this very set here. Not in my first time. I, I remember that. Remember that? I remember yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. And you had it come. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying. So, yeah. I'm just All a right. team player. Take one for the team. <laughs> Take one for the team. Uh, well, welcome, Representative. Thank you. I appreciate that. Say, I wanted to have you on. We talked a little bit yesterday over the phone about Martin Luther King Day and its significance and what you Absolutely. felt about it. Absolutely. Could you share with the viewers a little bit tonight about uh, and, and what, what what was going through your mind yesterday? Yeah. You know, it's always good to reflect on Martin Luther King Day um, about the progress that our country has made. I think often we look at it in terms of all of the bad things that happened throughout the year and segregation and dogs and Jim Crow and that stuff, and that is extremely important. But it also speaks to all of the gains that we've made because of Dr. King's legacy. You know, we know we have the first African-American president. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just here in, in Minneapolis, we have Representative Keith Ellison, who was the first Muslim in Congress. Uh, he also was one of two congressmen, if I, uh, if I, think, that's tr I think that's true, mm -hmm. that represent predominantly white districts, right. uh, which kind of flies in the face of some of the perceptions that the only way you get elected uh, is you have to be well, from you talk a majority about the, you used to talk district. about celebrating the good things. Absolutely. Let's, you know, not just what's Absolutely. Tonight on Capital Conversations, I'm happy to be joined by Representative Jim, Jim Abler, who's a Republican lawmaker from Anoka, and the new chair of the Health and Human Services Committee. How about that? That's 
Well, how about that? We'll talk <laughs> about that. And Representative Ryan Winkler, who I mentioned is a DFL uh, lawmaker from Golden Valley. What term are you in, Representative? Third term. Third term. Yeah, so you're relatively new here, but not so Not anymore. There. There's so many new people now. I'm an elder statesman. You Ooh. are. You wrote an editorial last summer, and this was coming, didn't you? <laughs> you wrote an editorial last summer in which you said, quote, with massive deficits facing our state as far as the eye can see, we have no choice but to contain our state health program costs while improving quality. If we fail, soon all our budget growth will be dedicated to unrestrained health care costs. There will be nothing left for K-12, college, the environment, basically anything else uh, that Minnesotans have come to expect, unquote. Now that was before you became Health and Human Services right. uh, Chair. <laughs> so has anything changed in your outlook uh, now that you're on the hot seat? Uh, it kind of came off sort of nice. Um, I tell you, it's interesting going from being a chair to being from a person who thought they'd spend quite a bit of time in the minority and just continue on in that way. Um, the sense of responsibility is really something. Um, it's one thing to be you know, working on projects and having a hand in some of them where, where you're allowed to work. It's something else having the concerns of 800,000 Minnesotans kind of in your lap and to look after what they might need and how you can help them. And, you know, help them move along and all their particular challenges they face. It's been overwhelming. Yeah, and well, and you've got a lot of difficult tasks ahead of you. We'll talk more about that, but uh, your thoughts, Representative Winkler, on uh, Jim Abler's uh, taking the chair and uh, the, the, the stuff that he's going to have to face in that committee. Do you sympathize? Is there well, I do, the I do. I mean, I know that Jim cares very much about the outcome of our, uh, you know, the bills that we pass and the outcome of the budget that we pass. Um, the fact of the matter is with, you know, $6.2 billion in deficit um, and the, uh, I guess, the mandate from the Republican leadership to not have any kind of revenue be part of this budget solution, the mammoth amount of budget cuts are coming out of Health and Human Services. And I know that uh, Jim doesn't want to have to inflict that kind of pain, but that's unfortunately the reality that he's in, and so I do sympathize. Um, I think we could have a better uh, balance of, of um, uh, approaches to the budget. We could include some revenue. We could make sure that there is no one group that's targeted unfairly, but uh, one way or the other there's going to be pain, and uh, Jim's going to have to be the yeah. one inflicting a lot of that. Welcome back to Capital Conversations. I'm Marty Owings, joined by our producer, Craig Stahlmacher, and our assistant producer, remotely coordinating all of our interactivity, is Susan Maracle. Thanks for joining us tonight. All right, uh, joining us on the program now is Mr. Matt Elling, and uh, is Elling the right Ewing. Ewing. Okay, I'm glad you corrected me. That's Matt right. Ewing, a television producer, writer, filmmaker, uh, man of the town. Renaissance Matt. His company, Public Record Media, created the documentary Open Source, which was an examination of citizen involvement in Minnesota government. That's right. Happy to have you on the program. Thanks for the invite. Thanks for being here. And you can find out more at publicrecordmedia.com. And Susan will put that up on the screen, our assistant producer. Also joining us tonight uh, is political reporter Eric Black. Who spent more than 30 years with the Star Tribune. That's right, isn't it, Eric? That's right, 30 yeah. years. A long time. Ridiculous. <laughs> well, I wouldn't characterize it. Lack of ambition. Of well, but not so, because you've written numerous books, and uh, and you're also uh, currently, you pen the popular Eric Black Inc. column for Men Post. Is that correct? I have that distinction. Yeah. And uh, they can find out more about you at menpost.com forward slash Eric Black. Just how it sounds. You got my name right. Also <laughs> joining us is Rich Newmeister, and Rich is a uh, information advocate, really, who has championed open government and citizen privacy for more than three decades. Three decades is about right. Yeah, you've been at it as long as uh, Mr. Black. Um, <laughs> he is a recipient of the pre prestigious John R. Finnegan Award for his tireless work on transparency and privacy issues. Here, welcome, Rich. Thank you. Glad to have you on the show. All right, let's start with you, Matt. What the heck? Why did you create this documentary? It's, it's, it was ambitious. It uh, cost a lot. Look at the production value. I was thought I was watching Ken Burns. Oh, well, it was thanks. Awesome. I'm glad you appreciated it. Yeah. I, uh, there's themes I've returned to in making documentary work, both for TV and radio, and, and uh, now writing in the last couple of years uh, again and again. And one of those themes is, is uh, looking at how the political process works. And, uh, and anybody who's taken Civics 101 knows we live in a representative democracy. You vote, 
people go to the legislature and they uh, they you know work in your work for your benefit. Um, they make decisions for you. Um, but there's a whole other culture, and it's really grown over the last couple of decades, three or four decades. Uh, it came out of the, the student movements of the 60s, this idea of participatory democracy, um, that people will get directly involved in, uh, in the political process, you know, to, to change policy, to guide policy, to work with representatives, um, to do, that, do, so, excuse me, do those things. And so that, I was curious to kind of show that, show that how it works here in Minnesota. Now, Mr. Black, you... Uh, You've been around. I mean, there's no political question I could even ask you that you don't know the answer to. But this this happens to be uh, citizen involvement up here at the Capitol happens to be, uh, you know, something that you've been involved, I think, involved in quite a bit with this documentary. When you heard the people talking uh, through this, did you walk away with any different thoughts about your... your well, more of a different feeling, and it's a feeling of just being inspired by people's willingness to uh, get off their duff and try to do something. You know, I, mean, uh, I get paid for what I do, uh, and journalists tend to hide behind uh, sort of a, a, an excuse for not participating because we're supposedly preserving our objectivity. But uh, it's not too late to, to be inspired by people who uh, decide that uh, they've got an idea, they're going to see if they can uh, get people who are in the government to listen to them. And uh, someone like Rich, who's been doing it so long for such a good cause, uh, without getting paid. They ask the question why. The good ones ask why. Why was this important? Why was it important for you to be engaged and why did you get involved? Well, I always wanted to be a movie star. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, you have the, you know, boyish good looks. I can say that. <laughs> There's a watchdog agency up here. Somebody thinks, I, I, most of the average people I talk to, Rich, they think, well, the, the, there's somebody watching over the government and, and it's Rich Newmeister, <laughs> you know? And so let's talk a little bit about you know, you've got some high, hard pressing issues. I should mention your blog is opensecretsmn.blogspot.com. Or else they can get there to Rich Neumeister. Right. Com too. Sure. And we'll put that out. Uh, um, I just want to say the thin line, and I think I have to give my hands off to the document, you know, Matt and Eric for doing it because one of the great things is yes, there is a thin line. Um, in terms of its citizen involvement, citizen coming up here saying, what the hell you're doing, or, you know, not in a negative, you know what I mean, but just uh, what's, watch, going, on? what's yeah. going on, with the who, what, where, and why is on bills or legislation or something. Um, there's a thin line, because if people aren't engaged, I think, you know, big negative things can happen. <laughs> Joining us now are two veteran lawmakers and one rookie. First, we'll start with Representative Tom Rukavina, he's a DFLer from the range, right. and uh, in Thank his thirteenth term, we yep. were just discussing. You've been here longer than uh, before the Twins' first World Series. Actually, I've been here longer than the Capitol. <laughs> no, I, I wasn't going to say that. You and, and most recently, you ran for the DFL nomination for governor in the last election, but we're didn't win that one either. Bitterly, <laughs> no, Bitter. just, you know, no, that's not, not at all. That's we also. Lot. We also have uh, Representative Denny McNamara. He's a Republican from the town of Hastings, Minnesota, and you're in your fifth term. I am, Marty. Yeah. Hello. Well, glad to be here. <laughs> thanks for being here. And you are also the chair of the Environment, and uh, there is a long name, Environment, Energy, Natural Resources, Policy, and Finance Committee. I am. And they can't fit that all on one plaque, right? It's got, uh, I don't know. Two? I haven't got a plaque yet, but I don't um, need a plaque. We just want yeah. to do the business of this state. I understand. I can appreciate that. And finally, Representative Bob Barrett joins us. He's a brand new GOP Republican. Oh, I guess that goes together. Sure. Uh, from, from the great town of Schaefer. Thank you very much. Schaefer, Miss. You ever go hunting down there, Representative Barrett? Not in Schaefer. Not in Schaefer. No. no. All right. But I represent the folks in Chicago County and uh, North Branch, uh, Taylor's Falls, Lindstrom, Wyoming. Yeah. Happy right. to be here. It's all nice area. Yeah. Thanks for coming. You're welcome. All right, guys. Let's. Uh, First up, let's get your 30-second take on the budget uh, put forth lately by, uh, by most recently by the GOP. Let's get you you to start. Well, I got seniority, so let me go. Second. Right? Yeah. You, 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 no, no, you We're go first. Get oh, no, I want to go second. I want, to, I want a bad cleanup. Oh, okay. I see. You could go first. Well, you know what? Let me just say this: We're in a terrible mess. A $6.2 billion deficit. Uh, but you all agree on we, that? No, we knew it was. We knew it was coming. It might be a little bigger than that. 
management. If you factor in inflation, we knew it was coming. We've known it was coming for a long time. We've had uh, deficit spending for, I believe, seven of the last eight years, mm -hmm. um, if not six at the, at the very least of the last eight years. So now all of the, uh, you know, all the gimmicks and uh, all the low-hanging fruit is gone, and uh, these two over here have a real tough job, and I wish them the best of luck and want to see how they do it because the way they started, you know, yesterday by attacking public employees, uh, uh, I thought was not a good way to start, but, you know, that's, that's class warfare in their opinion. Well, we'll get, we'll get My to that. My class warfare is more fair. We'll uh, Representative uh, Rucavino, we'll, we'll get to that, but I, I, I got to stop you for a second. Now. Why, why do Democrats always talk about the six point two billion dollar deficit, but they never mention the thirty four billion dollars we hand over to the state every year of citizens? Well, well, that's a big pot of money. You well, because to spend. it is a very big pot of money. There's no doubt about it. But we have to balance our budget, and we've made obligations, and we have new people coming on programs, whether it's. Uh, you know, uh, more people in the K-12 education right. system or we're required to give everybody an equal education or taking care of our elderly and sick and we all right. know that yeah. having had two parents yeah. that ended up in a nursing home, uh, you know, that were taken uh, very well taken care of by, I call it those public employees, mm. those ask me angels that took care of my parents. Well, there's all kinds of God new bless people the unions, going on right. this system. I know, just so that's why. But, you know, it's funny you should mention that, Representative McNair. I want to go to you next, but, you know, uh, Representative Rukavina says, you know, there's more people, you know, involved in K-12, and yet there's schools closing everywhere. Drive through my area in Maplewood, there's two, three schools just closed down elementary. Fewer student enrollment. You, you, you know, Marty, uh, Representative Rukavina has been through a lot of the things that, that many of us have. In, in his case, his parents, it was the Ask Me workers at, uh, um, at the nursing home. In my, in my case, it was the SEIU workers at, with my mother-in-law. Unbelievably great people taking care of her at the Regina Medical Center in Hastings. And, and you know, those are the kind of folks that we're going to prioritize and take care of. The elderly in nursing homes, uh, the disabled, uh, the people. Minnesota is a good state. We're a caring state. We have to realize that. But Representative Rukavina brings up a good point. Um, we have to be able to say no. I mean, the idea that we just say yes to everybody doesn't work. We have a limited budget. We actually are going to have more money in the next two years than we had in the last two. And if you tell folks in Minnesota, can you get by in the next two years with what you lived on last year, most of them would say, I could only wish I had as much in a lot of cases. You're very good at spreadsheets. You're a numbers guy. I'm a numbers guy. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and you, that. you like to crunch the numbers. I what do you think about this whole uh, budget situation? Is, is, is that a, a straw man, the argument, the $6.2 billion when you already have $34 billion? What, what's the argument? Well, the people that know claim, say we have a $6.2 billion deficit. Well, That's, claim, no, your, your same side does. Right, too. no, I mean, right, right, we do. So okay. I'm stating right, you agree. My, my point is we're st stating a fact that we have right. a budget deficit. And, uh, I, you know, I didn't create the deficit. You know, it was there when I got here. I got here about three weeks ago. Right. So we have to solve the problem. And that's what the people in my district want me to do. They want me to solve the problem of the deficit. They want me to do it without raising taxes. That's the mandate I was given by the people that put me here. I went door to door, talked to so many people. So many people are out of work. Their house is being foreclosed. Their wife and or her husband have left them. They don't have a job. So we need jobs. And we have to have jobs by uh, incenting the private sector. And yeah. so that's my mandate. That's. What I care about at this we'll point. Get, we'll get to I, I just don't think eliminating, uh, you know, uh, state jobs is the way to solve the well. I think there's the a job a, problem. That, that, I, I just want to play a clip from the Region Five EPA guy who had a lot to say. You both about this mine. It's only a couple seconds or so. Okay, let's, watch. let's listen to this, and uh, we'll come back and get your response. The EPA would give it an historically low rating of EU minus three on February 18th. And after three Senate hearings here and one House hearing, I thought we needed one more witness from the EPA, the author of the 28-page letter, Ken Westlake. I called him on March 17th, and here is his characterization of the PolyMet plan. And I hear that this is a rather rare rating that isn't given out very often. It is. Um... Uh, certainly the, the first time a uh, Region 5 project has received this rating in my nine plus years in, in my current position. Um, 
and I think we've only done seven adverse ratings uh, in Region 5 total since um, our national database was created in 1987. Okay, here's the deal, Marty, on that. First of all, you know, uh, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers was the lead federal agency, and the right. polymet folks did exactly what the Army Corps of Engineers asked them to do. The EPA was never involved in, in any of the requirements that polymet, the, the company, was told to do by both the DNR, who's the permitting agency, and the okay. lead agency in Minnesota, and uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. And then all of a sudden they get to Chicago, where this quote must have come from, and, uh, you know, uh, the EPA jumps in. Uh, their, their problem was uh, the DNR and the Army Corps of Engineers told PolyMet to, to give us a couple of paths we can follow. Yeah. So their uh, environmental impact, uh, you know, their permitting request was, uh, was had three or four different paths mm -hmm. that you could go down to solve some of the problems that need to be addressed with copper yeah. nickel mining. Sure. And they did exactly what the Army Corps of Engineers told them to do. So okay. my understanding is that guy from the EPA got his rear end chewed after that. But, well, you know, but that's there's lawsuits irritating. flying. Yeah. And he's a long-time uh, Republican political analyst, publisher, former lobbyist, and frequent contributor to various media outlets in the Twin Towns, and throughout Minnesota. Yeah. Internationally. And I'm wearing my Ugg boots. Yeah. Well, you get a muck lux when it's In honor of your show. Well, I appreciate it. And really do. And, uh, and also, Rob Hahn is a one-time radio producer, a publisher, an author, and most recently a candidate uh, for governor. Uh, and for now I'm an analyst, right? Governor. Is that what that does? <laughs> well, it, it certainly could be helps. worse, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Pretty right. much worse. You, you know, get some quick reaction to what you heard tonight uh, in terms of the budget discussion. It's not just these guys who are wonderful. It's everybody. You know, we're deeply in debt. I, I, while you were talking, I quickly looked up the num current number of state employees. It's 32,000 people. Yeah. That is a drop in the bucket. And so the focus on, on public, com uh, public employee compensation is ridiculous. But what really has to happen, which won't happen because the players all have too many vested interests, we have to look at the whole thing. 87 counties, 854 cities, 300-some school districts, 150-some charter schools. All of it, because that's the only way we're going to. We just have to retool everything for the for, for the times that are now. Right. And it's and I just I don't hear any of that conversation happening here. You agree? I do absolutely. I mean, it can't just be let's cut here a little, let's cut here a little, and hope it works. The, the band-aid approach, as I like to say, it's got to be an overall vision of reforms. Here's what we're going to do: we're going to take uh, health and human services. And instead of having them delivered by 85 or 87 counties, we're going to create four or five different right. regions. And uh, it's going to take time. So through that time and through attrition, we can reduce the workforce, workforce without putting people on the streets unemployed. Mm -hmm. So I think there can be a way to do it, but it can't be done just all in one year, and it can't be done with the, in kind of a piecemeal process. Right. And I, and I think the problem we have is having interviewed 700-some legislators when they first walked into the Capitol for my, the book I sold. Uh, is that most of the people who serve here have come up through the system. They've been elected to their townships, elected to their cities, elected to their counties, and perhaps the most influential constituents that legislators have are all those elected officials. So actually, whacking anything is a very difficult proposition. Yeah. Now we're joined by Professor Doug Rossano. I'll start, I'll go from end over here. Doug Rossano is the Distinguished History Chair at Metro State University and the author of several books on the American political system. Professor Rossno is a frequent contributor to KFAI's political coverage and is uh, known to write the occasional op-ed piece on Minnesota Capitol News. Welcome to the program. Professor. Great to be here, Mike. Thank you for coming. Also joining us is Mitch Berg. He's host of AM 1280's Northern Alliance radio program, uh, heard from 1 to 3 locally. Is it still Saturday? One That's to right. Three? Saturdays 1 to 3. Still Saturdays 1 to 3. I tune in when I can. Reminding and, you uh, that it's four days until Reagan's birthday, by the way, speaking of shopping days until major holidays. That the Emmer about the campaign. Well, I think Tom Emmer's message is a pretty familiar one to the voters of the state. Uh, at this point, what you heard from him tonight were the same themes that he voiced during the campaign. Uh, and. They talked, uh, we talked earlier about the, the polls and how some of the polls really did not predict the outcome of the race. Clearly that was true. Uh, partly that might have been due to undersampling of Republicans in some polls, but also clearly it was due, at least in some part, and maybe in large part, to the fact there was a huge Republican wave this year. It was a great year to run as a Republican, just like 2006 was 
2006 was a great year to run as a Democrat. So. Uh, and that wave just about carried Emmer across the finish line. It was a very close thing. And I think that uh, the fact that Emmer came as close as he did to winning is a tribute not just to uh, the strength of his campaign and his discipline and energy on the stump, but also to the fact that this was a big Republican year. I think in most gubernatorial election years, Emmer would have had difficulty making a strong fight of it because he was such an outspokenly conservative candidate, but not this year. This year it was, uh, it was very close. And so, you know, you heard from Emerald what you heard from him during the campaign. Do you think, though, that the polling in particular, and I'll get, get your chance to jump in here too, Mitch, the polling in particular, that combined with the, the Horner factor, I mean, if those two things don't happen, is Tom Emmer the governor right now? Well, you know, I'm not a polling expert, uh, but I would urge a note of caution in terms of speculating about what impact the polls might have had in the closing days and weeks of the race, because you can make speculation in more than one direction. You could speculate that it discouraged some Emmer supporters, but you could also, on the other hand, make the case that uh, it made some Dayton leaners feel like it wasn't very important for them to come out and vote. Maybe it made some of them stay home. So I'm not sure how that really plays out. I do think it's likely that in a big Republican year, a lot of late deciders went for Emmer, uh, and that may account for some of the uh, space he made up, at least according to some of the polls at the end. So the impact that the polls had on the voters, I'm not so sure. There was some discussion of the impact that polls would have on donors, and I think that's a serious matter. But it did, it did seem as if, in the end, both major party candidates were adequately funded. They both got their messages out. Yeah. Uh, Mitch, your thoughts? Well, you're chomping at the bit. I certainly yeah. am. And there's three, okay. three major points I'd like to touch on. First of all, the adequate funding. Uh, state fair campaign finance reports came out today showing that Dayton spent uh, over twice what Emmer spent during the campaign year, and most of that, a uh, very significant chunk of that came from unions and uh, the Dayton family itself. So the funding discrepancy is certainly an interesting factor as well. But I want to go back to the the, uh, the, the, the polling and, and a point that you made there that I thought was interesting and deserves a little looking into. Uh, one of the few constants we have in life in Minnesota here is that the Hubert H. Humphrey poll will underpoll Republicans by, uh, on an average of eight points. We're talking good years for Republicans, like this year. We're talking bad years for Republicans, like 2006 and 2008. The results at the end of the, of the campaign changed wildly, but the one constant was the Hubert H. Humphrey poll underpolled Republicans by uh, an average of around eight points. Uh, that's uh, election in, election out, and the only thing that, uh, that, that makes it notable is it's worse than the same tendency that the Star Tribune poll showed in exactly the same, just slightly less uh, pronounced in the case of the, of the, uh, the Minnesota poll. Um, so that's the one thing. I mean, the, and I was doing a little digging into this uh, towards the, right after the campaign, and uh, while there's a lot of talk about what effect it may have had, there's actually some academic research on the subject. Dr. Abramian did a piece in a 19, or survey, rather, study in 1996 during the Dole campaign about the bandwagon effect that polling has on voters. Yeah. And uh, basically uh, showed in 1996 that voters who showed were shown the polls, fictional as it happens, that uh, Steve Forbes was running way behind were less likely to show up. And oh. it's uh, there's, there's a certain amount of academic uh, evidence that, in fact, there is a bandwagon effect, and and one way or the other, these polls do have an effect on on turnout. Let's take a tour of our state. Yeah, I'm a project manager with uh, real estate and construction, which is a division of the administration department. And background is uh, I'm an architect, uh, but most of my career has been working in as a project manager. Just the netting on the scaffolding here, that's to protect the um, the horses in every way so nothing can fall on them? Yeah, and this was, we left it up here for the winter rather than have the expense of taking it down. Every year we do about $25,000 worth of uh, regilding hmm. and repair on the quadriga, and typically that's more towards the back of the sculpture. Harvey Yeager showed me a number of places where there is water damage. Here we're missing a part of the mural. Unless somebody points points you really to it, you don't really see it in, until you get closer. And so, um, but if we doing this see other the up here, hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage. Yeah, when you think of it, really. Yeah. And so when the, this repair work that we were doing, it really allowed us to look at some things closely that we really hadn't had an opportunity for many, many years. And. Uh, 
you know, when we get close, we found that there's other things that need to be done. And, and uh, until we had the drum wrapped with scaffolding, uh, you, didn't you just, really know you, what you just couldn't like. uh, mm -hmm. see things. All you could see is what you could look up at when you can look straight at or down at something uh, you're able to see. How about the you know, sticky of, aspects of um, how do we pay for this? How are we funding this? Is there always a perpetual fund to, to pay for the dome? Uh, no. The uh, money right now is coming from uh, an appropriation from 2008 for asset preservation. The mm. uh, legislature appropriated that, and that's mainly to um, help keep the building watertight and do some uh, badly needed repairs and also to deal with some ventilation systems that are very old and need to be repaired. And so we're, uh, that's the pool of money we're working with uh, at this point. Do we have enough? <laughs> now that you've taken a good look, do you think that there's going to be enough in that pool? Do you might have to ask for more or extend the project? Uh, that pool had about 13, about 13 and a half million dollars, and uh, uh, further study is being done about other work that needs to be done. But it's it's going to take a considerable amount to. That's the total total project right now is 13 and a half million. Yes, and that's not just the dome. The dome is about four million out of that. Ah. And then Harvey Yeager would take me to one last inner space. Way up at the top, we would be up on top of the inner dome and look down. And then he would show me the unique structure of the Minnesota State Capitol. We have three domes inside each other. This is a surprise then, I think, for most people, that there are three domes. This is the outer dome right here, an inner dome, a middle dome. And then we were standing on the tile inner dome, the third dome. Interesting. A surprise. Yeah. So and then right here it's um, masonry and it gets the masonry gets a little bit thinner as it goes up to reduce weight, but then on the outside there's the uh, marble that you see on the outside of the building. Hmm. Future at all? What, what are you gonna do? You know what? I, David has taught me never to say never Good. because I was uh, asked a couple of times long ago. And not asked, it was suggested, you know, you should run for governor. And I would answer very quickly, absolutely not. <laughs> I will never do that. I think that's one of the that's statements I made uh, a couple of years back, and I was left alone. And then I find myself running for it. And you know what? I, I don't know if running for political office uh, will be in my future. I would not say never. But I do know that being involved is going to be in my future at some level. And it's going to be involved uh, speaking the truth making sure people understand that we've got to go back to giving people the freedom to create. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, that's where I'm going to be the most helpful, and I think uh, people like David Fitzsimmons have inspired me yeah. to get on that street level. You know, I, I've been given a, an ability to communicate uh, at a level that I just like people. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. as long as I can deliver like our message with people, you know, that guy yeah. that was yelling at me, I yeah. used to love to do the Bob Dole when they'd be yelling, Emmer, you this and that, and I'd turn and go, well, Mark, you down is on this side. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and that's, you disarm people, and that's good about you. Matter of fact, you, do, you did it to me so many times, I lost count. But, uh, <laughs> I'd always come up and I'd have a head full of good hard hitting questions, and then we'd be talking hockey for 30 seconds. Hockey but, or baseball? Uh, coming by. Good to see you again, Good to see you, Marty. Tom Emmer, representative, yeah. and yeah, you too, Marty. David Fitzsimmons. And thanks a lot for your uh, for your insights and helping out and uh, getting this arranged. And you were absolutely uh, the architect of uh, what, what many consider the strongest Republican run in a long time. Thank you. Eight thousand votes. Yeah, You're a lot to be proud of. It. I mean, from any political standpoint. So. Yeah, but we were eight thousand too short, as I told my daughter. <laughs> yeah. You have a winner. You have a loser. There are no ties. Right. We didn't win. Right. We'll see what happens in the future. We won from the standpoint that our message you hear around these halls every day now. Government must live within its means. Right. You can't spend money you don't have. We gotta start creating new jobs in the state of Minnesota. Most rewarding part of the whole campaign. And then hanging out with guys like you. <laughs> and and our well, I won't even mention the name. Don't don't mention the Stellmacher. <laughs> <laughs> when we return back to the Capitol here, we'll be joined by...